I'm James Shapiro, professor of English at Columbia University, and I'm happy to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the celebration of Shakespeare in Buenos Aires. And I really loved um, my visit to Buenos Aires. I know because of COVID, I can't be returning to speak to you directly, but it is an honor to be speaking to you uh, in this way uh, in celebration of a remarkable achievement, a 10th anniversary uh, to acknowledge Shakespeare, to make him part of the cultural conversation. Okay, Jim, so uh, let's go to 1865. Um, and I was wondering, uh, why do you believe that Lincoln was the uh, uh, best reader uh, of Shakespeare in America? That's a, a strong claim for me. And obviously there are many scholars who spend their lives reading, researching, teaching Shakespeare. Stephen Greenblatt is, is uh, the most illustrious of them. But the more time you spend with Abraham Lincoln, who had almost no formal education, he grew up on a farm, maybe he had a few months here and there when he was a child in school. And uh, he didn't get to study Shakespeare. His stepmother brought a number of books with her when she moved into the log cabin with Lincoln's family. And one of those books had several dozen excerpts from Shakespeare's play, including Hamlet, Julius Caesar, and other plays. And Lincoln, as a young man, began memorizing these speeches. And for the rest of his life, until a Shakespeare actor assassinated him in, in April of 1865, he immersed himself in Shakespeare. And the reason why I think that he was to my mind, the greatest reader of Shakespeare in this country is that uh, as depressed an individual as he was, he nonetheless opened himself up to Shakespeare. And Shakespeare gave him a way of locating a lot of his pain and a lot of his guilt. So he, for example, thought that Claudius's speech late in Hamlet about his own guilt was so much better than Hamlet's to be or not to be speech. And he kept coming back to figures like Macbeth, the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech of somebody who is guilt ridden. And this was a man who presided over a nation at war in which 700,000 Americans died. So Shakespeare just flowed through him and every opportunity he had to recite Shakespeare. Even when the people in the room didn't particularly want to hear Lincoln reciting Shakespeare, he took that opportunity and he obviously read this stuff aloud again and again. It penetrated his dream life. He was fully engaged with Shakespeare in a way that I I've never encountered in any other individual. Well, finally, uh, Lincoln had a tragic ending. <laughs> he, he was killed close to the stage. And there's this fantastic story in which you link him with his murderer and Shakespeare. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? John Wilkes Booth was the son of one of the great, great British actors. He was the third son to go into the Shakespeare business as a way. And unlike his, his brother, Edwin Booth, or his other brother, Junius, uh, he gravitated toward a Southern Shakespeare. And by that, I mean a Shakespeare who spoke to the values of a slave society, especially one that was facing defeat in the Civil War. 
what we now call the lost cause. So when John Wilkes Booth played Hamlet or played Macbeth, which was Lincoln's favorite play, he didn't play him as a cerebral individual. He played him as a doomed but physically gallant and active individual. And when I was researching John Wilkes Booth's career as a, as a Shakespeare actor, one of the things that I thought was most remarkable was he would come to some small town to play Shakespeare and he would play the lead and 20 or so local actors would flesh out the cast. And he would only want to do the final act of Macbeth. The first four acts meant nothing to him. What mattered was the fight scene at the end where he could play a doomed individual fighting to his death. And of course, after he assassinated Lincoln and was on the run, he kept referring in his diary to Macbeth and how people didn't appreciate his actions. He also thought of himself as a kind of Brutus, an American Brutus, but the reviews of his act were not good. And you just have this, you know, Shakespearean collision of two people who have radically different understandings of the play. One is a white supremacist, the other is the president of the United States. Yeah. So that, that, that chapter wanted to be a book so badly. And I kept, every day I came back to it, cutting it down and then it got bigger and I had to cut it down again so uh, that it didn't take over the book. But I'm, I'm glad you began with that one because that chapter is the one I'm most proud of. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I found it uh, two events in which uh, reality breaks into fiction. And that is one in your book. That, that, is, that is really one. The other one we'll, we'll talk a little bit later. There's, there's another chapter on immigration, right? And how Caliban, uh, in a way was uh, helping the Tempest uh, to, to, to come alive in, in America. And there's this big uh, show that's called uh, Caliban in Yellow Sands with 7,000 performers. How was that? I mean, Percy McKay, who created that show, Caliban by the Yellow Sand, um, was part of a movement to have mass theater. And his previous show in St. Louis had 100,000 people a day seeing these plays. I don't really even know how before broadcasting of sound, they were able to project that much. But 7,000 people are involved with this and it's extraordinary. And of course, in the audience of tens of thousands of people in New York City, were many, many, many immigrants because at the turn of the century, New York was an immigrant community. And it was sobering to see how Shakespeare's character of Caliban was used as a kind of stand-in for the unwashed, half-human, half-beastly immigrant. And uh, even though Percy McKay was progressive, he was still a kind of waspy guy. And uh, he could not imagine these immigrants fully integrated into American culture. So that his Caliban is always and repeatedly threatening to rape Miranda. And he never kind of learns his lesson. And living through Trump's America where the president, former president of the United States keeps talking about how People are coming from Central America into America to rape our women. It was very hard writing that chapter without thinking of the legacy of that thinking about immigration. Because it's, it's easy to forget that until 1900, America had open doors that it allowed anybody who was fleeing religious or political persecution to enter the country, including my ancestors and Donald Trump's ancestors. And this moment where Caliban is used in a weaponized way to fight immigration or to question immigration policies marks a sea change in American history. And as we move forward now in 2021, we'll, 
we'll see what kind of immigration agreements we can we can arrive at. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it, it's it's very interesting the different points of view that uh, the character of Caliban had along the twentieth century. Started as an immigrant, uh, then we have the uh, post-colonial approach, and finally, um, Caliban could be seen as a victim because he he's claiming the uh, property of the island, right? He He's saying that he owns the island and well, prosper on the rest of the Italians. Those are the immigrants really, right? And uh, Exactly, I, that's very astute, that's very astute. You know, I, I think that you can look at this play and look at many of them and their fortunes go up and down. It's almost like a stock market where not just plays but characters within plays take on a different prominence. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, to go from the Caliban who is a beast uh, you know, in the late 19th century in London, Shakespeare actors would go to the zoo to study primates to learn how to play Caliban. And now Caliban is, as you say, the archetypal victim in a culture which really is fascinated with, perhaps too fascinated with, victimization. So again and again, um, Shakespeare allows us to see what we otherwise might not see so clearly, which is changing values in, in a culture. And uh, that uh, takes me to um, the context of, of Shakespeare plays nowadays. Uh, we have Caliban, as you said, but we have also Othello, Shylock, Shrew, and all these uh, uh, social movements of uh, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and uh, this, what is called now the, the cancel culture, right? Uh, how, how do you think that Shakespeare should navigate this? this uh, that's, that's a great question. And that is probably the most central question facing anybody who teaches or stages or writes about Shakespeare today. And uh, I have good friends who are Shakespeare scholars who say Othello and less often the Merchant of Venice should not be staged. They should not be staged. And I, I don't believe this. I've never believed this. My argument is short of violence. In other words, if a production of the Merchant of Venice led to a pogrom, I would not advocate staging it. But short of violence, I think these feelings are there within the culture. And I want to know about them so that the way I describe it in the book is Shakespeare is a canary in the coal mine. When coal miners go down beneath the earth and they want to make sure there's no toxic air, they keep the canary in a cage. And if that canary dies, it's time to get out of there because the air is too toxic. I feel that way about America. Shakespeare for me is that canary. And when things become too toxic here and they were becoming very toxic under Donald Trump, um, it's time to flee. As my ancestors flee their country, I'm an American and a, uh, a very patriotic one, but uh, when the time comes and you have to flee, you have to flee. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I, I, I'm nervous about cancel culture. Uh, it's, it's changed the way uh, productions uh, are discussed. It changes the way you can teach Shakespeare. Uh, in, in a culture sensitive to microaggression, Shakespeare is macroaggression. People are raped, people are beheaded, people are exiled, people are tortured, yeah. people have their eyes gouged out in these plays. So when I teach Shakespeare, I bring in a copy of the first folio, the first day of class. And I said, some of you prefer trigger warnings. This one volume is a massive trigger warning of every horrible thing that human beings can do. And if you're not comfortable with this, take a different class because Shakespeare is just wrestling with things that I don't put it this way, but might, that a cancel culture can't easily grapple with. I'm not interested in canceling, I'm interested in confrontation because that's what drama is about. Yeah, exactly. 
And then uh, I pointed out uh, a, a second event in which reality breaks into uh, fiction. And that was the uh, Julius Caesar production of the public theater. Uh, would you like to share with us? Sure. That experience. Right, right after uh, the election of Donald Trump in 2016, no, November of 2016, I was called into uh, the public theater where I'm Shakespeare scholar in residence by the artistic director, Oscar Eustace. He, he's a great guy, a visionary and um, to the left. And he'll proudly open up his wallet and show you his mother's communist party card, a little red card from the, the 30s. So he's, he's quite open about his political leanings. And he said, I want to do Julius Caesar. And, and you know, usually I'm brought into productions because some directors are not confident in making cuts. They don't know the plays very well. So part of my job is providing a cut in consultation with the director. Oscar had done this play three times. I think he just wanted to bounce his ideas off of me. And uh, he had thought it out pretty clearly. And his vision of the play was to challenge a mostly liberal New York audience to confront their desires. And their desires would be, he would have an actor who looked just like Donald Trump play Julius Caesar and be assassinated on stage. And Trump's wife would be played by an actress who looked just like her and sounded like her with her Eastern European accents. And uh, he would do one more thing that was quite brilliant because he's artistic director and has a budget that ordinarily directors don't have. He hired 50 additional actors to sit quietly in this modern dress production in the audience, scattered throughout this audience. And at the moment that Brutus and his fellow conspirators assassinated this Trump-like Caesar, they stood up in ones and twos and started yelling and screaming and berating the conspirators for what they had done. What Oscar Eustace wanted to do was create a sense of whiplash. We wanna see this Trump-like proto-fascist leader killed, but you don't preserve democracy by undemocratic means. So it was a great concept for a production. And having, and having the Trump supporters uh, uh, claiming for democracy and for, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and the only thing that messed this up was um, the right wing heard about this production. Nobody was complaining. I think there were eight letters in the first month of the production saying, you know, we don't like a Trump like Caesar, but you know, that's less than normal. And you, you get complaints of all kinds all the time with Shakespeare productions. But the last week, Fox News and other uh, right wing organs began to clamor for pulling sponsorship and for the censorship and physical disruption. In other words, they, uh, a right wing activist offered to pay $1,000 to anybody who would rush the stage and stop the production. And sure enough, right wing activists took them up on that. And I was, because I was part of the creative team, I had a pass that led me into the theater. By now the lines were every morning, three hours or four hours long to get a free ticket to see this play. And I just walked into my seat near the rear of the theater and watched as a woman ran onto stage and her accomplice filmed this and brought the production to a halt. And then on successive nights, more right-wing activists threatened the actors. One was caught bringing paintballs that could have blinded actors. There were death threats, the FBI, the Secret Service, the New York police and many other agencies were brought in and it was terrifying. And what would happen is you would watch Caesar assassinated. Then you'd watch the actors who are fake right-wing activists stand up and protest. And then real right-wing activists would rush the stage. 
and the audiences were getting extremely nervous and confused. And I, I, I don't write about this in the book, but I got so anxious one night watching a production that I started to get up and walk out. And as you know, I, I, I'm a, a white guy in his 60s and I look like a Trump supporter. And the security team went to tackle me because I was leaving in the middle of the production. And luckily a friend in the security stopped them or I would have been hogtied and dragged out. So when the events that took place in January 6th at the Capitol happened of right-wing activists rushing and creating violence and storming uh, the Capitol. It was a replay of the theater, life imitating art in that way. And it's a wonderful example of how theater, great theater, can feel something in the air and sense it even if it hasn't yet hit the newspapers, it will. And that's what this production did. Yes, well, that well, the 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 the, the Trump supporters uh, storming the the U.S. Capitol building, that was to me like uh, the opposite way. It was like uh, fiction breaking into reality because that, I mean, that that guy with fur with horns walking in there with a scepter. What was that, <laughs> right? I mean, well, I, you know, that's a really good point, and it kind of suggests how theatrical that whole event was. That people dressed up, they put on costumes, they carried props. They wanted to pose themselves in certain scenes, sitting in Nancy Pelosi's office with their feet above uh, on her table. So that there was uh, this need to dramatize what they were doing. It was violent, but it was also theatrical. And again, Shakespeare anticipates all of this in a play like Julius Caesar, uh, Coriolanus, other plays uh, that are deeply political. And, and uh, reaching this state of, of division, right, that we are currently also having in Argentina and I believe in many other countries around the world, uh, this like radicalization of, of points of view how uh, do you think that Shakespeare could help us uh, to be more united as a society? That's a really, really important question. And uh, I, I think Shakespeare is used in two ways that are diametrically opposed. One is Shakespeare has been weaponized, whether it's a weaponization of Caliban against immigration uh, or uh, Taming of the Shrew being weaponized in certain ways to suppress women's rights or to advocate for them. But the other half of the equation is we all love Shakespeare. We all own Shakespeare. We all claim Shakespeare. So I describe it as a kind of tug of war with those on the left and the right pulling on the rope equally. And sometimes one has the upper hand and sometimes the other has the upper hand. There, there are very few points of contact anymore culturally. We begin to speak a different language. We have different values. Shakespeare is one of the last islands of common ground. And it's very important that that be preserved. For me, I, I would welcome conservative or even right-wing productions of Shakespeare. They might offend me, but they might also make me see a perspective that I'm otherwise not open to seeing. And unless we can preserve a Shakespeare who is universally valued, we run the same risk that happened in Shakespeare's day in 1642 when the Globe Theater was pulled down and theater ended and there was revolution and violence for the next 20 years before Shakespeare could return to the stages in London and the rest of the world. So uh, I, there's no easy answer to that question. It's the right question. And we are now entering a world that is more and more divisive. And there's more and more need for Shakespeare in that world. 
I think that yeah, there's 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 a task for Shakespeare and also for the Shakespearean, right? I believe that because at the end of the day, that's that's what we are promoting, right? It's like it is, and we need good directors. We need people like you who uh, work between cultures. Argentinian, American, British that are international because Shakespeare is both local and global right now. And we need to value him in both of those ways. So I see you as one of the leaders in, in that capacity. Well, um, thank you very much, Jim, for, for sharing your wisdom. You're, you're always uh, very kind with us and you're, also, you're always supporting us. So so thank you, thank you very much. for. Thank you, I really appreciate that. All right, stay safe and well. Thank you.